Matthew chapter 11. We will read verses 28 through 30. Jesus is revealing the Father here in this great chapter, chapter 11, and uh, 28 through 30, and our text will be 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We'll be sharing some other verses along. I wanted to look at verse 28, entitled the message, Come. Come, we're speaking about salvation. Verses 29 and 30 are another command of Jesus about taking his yoke. That's more of surrender, submission. We want to look at the word come. What is the greatest invitation you ever received? Just think for a moment. The greatest invitation you've ever received. Was it a wedding invitation? Uh, was it a graduation, birthday, uh, was it something in the life of the church, was it some kind of special banquet that you met your family or your closest friends? There are many, many invitations in life. But Jesus gave a great invitation, didn't he? What's the first word, Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? You have to have it memorized. Come, say that with me. Come, come. It's his command. It's very personal. It's for you and me, and it's very powerful because it's from our Lord. First of all, tonight, I want to talk about the plea of Jesus. The plea of Jesus. Number one is to come. Who does Jesus say come to? Who does he plead to? The wanderer. I say the word wanderer is just another name for unsaved, lost, separated from God. Uh, Wednesday night I was here, I, I, I may even use this illustration again sometime, but not tonight. I used on Wednesday night the beautiful picture of a shepherd with his sheep and they went into the fold, you know, and they, we think of gates and uh, all these things, but they just basically had rocks. They put them up against the little mountainside or they made, had little rock things so high where the sheep couldn't hop over them, you know. But the shepherd was at the door. That's where we get, I am the door. Uh, I am the gate. Jesus was that, and the shepherds are like that to their sheep. And, uh, but you get a picture of people wandering, a sheep just wander around, and they just... They go out sometimes, and unless the shepherd calls and they stay close, they'll nibble themselves away. They really don't pay attention very well. Uh, Now, most of us here tonight are the same way. Would you not say that? Uh, You young uh, people tonight in your families, you know how you disobey your parents at times, don't you? Uh, I didn't hear any amen for that. Uh, I... We did it, and you have done it, and uh, your children and so forth will do it. So we nibble away. We see sheep nibbling and walking away because they won't stay with the shepherd. They won't keep him in view. Well, we can say tonight, Jesus is saying to the wanderer, he pleads uh, those going on their selfish way, the pride-filled way, the self-centered way. You know what happened to uh, Eve in the garden, don't you? She was on her self-centered way. She heard the voice of the evil one, Satan, Genesis 3. And she looked at that tree, and she knew not to eat it. He had all the other trees to eat of the fruit, but she would not stay away. She looked. It's the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. She, she just wanted it. It looked so good. She reached him, ate it, and gave it to Adam 
and there was the beginning of our original sin. We're all bent toward rebellion, disobedience to God. And we know where that road leads, don't we? Eternal death, hell. The Lord Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're lost, you're like a wanderer. You've got to come back home uh, to the Savior. He was on top of the tennis world some years ago. I think he was around 20 years old when I read this. He had everything the world could afford, but he had a problem. It was a heart problem. I'm talking about the spiritual heart. He was a wanderer. He was empty, unsatisfied, and was ready to commit suicide. Whoever you are tonight, wherever you are, the greatest need is to come, to come to Jesus. It's not sports, it's not Hollywood, it's not being a certain position of business. That's not the greatest thing you need to come to Jesus about. You need to come to Jesus for a relationship, a personal relationship to God through that son, Jesus. And if you're lost, you need to hear the plea of Jesus to come. The plea of Jesus is to come to thinkers, thinkers, intellectual people, knowledgeable people. There are many, many wonderful intellectual people today. You know that. Very knowledgeable. And some have even heard of the Savior. Many have heard of the name of Jesus. But they just think of Jesus. Jesus just doesn't want thinkers. He wants trusters, followers, believers. You see, we miss something when we just think about Jesus. We miss from the head to the heart. It says 18 inches. So if you just wanted to picture that in your mind, uh, being 18 inches away from, from the Lord and salvation. We read about a lot of people, George Washington, Abe Lincoln. Uh, I've read about Billy Graham before, and I've heard Billy Graham speak uh, you know, we see him on television or whatever, a great speaker for, for Jesus. But they do not save a soul. Uh, our minds uh, do not save us just by thinking about God or hearing about God. Jesus waits for the open door. So we need to trust Jesus. What did Paul say to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26? He was trying to persuade him to convince him that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. The only Savior and Lord, one who died, rose again. You know, King Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. You're about to convince me, uh, Paul. But he did not. We never read of anything that he ever came to trust Jesus. Paul pleaded with him that he would come to Jesus. The plea of Jesus to come is also for confusers. I call those unsaved church members. You know, isn't it interesting how a person can come to the house of God, hear the word of God over and over again, and not be moved toward God to come to Jesus? That's the way the Spirit of God comes to play, the Holy Spirit has to convict and convince a person of their need to come to Jesus. I remember that lady years ago. I, 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 just, I was just really almost fell out of the chair that evening. I had a deacon with me and uh, I was trying to visit some of the different people. I had not seen probably it's been a, it was a year or more. I saw her every Sunday. I could tell you exactly where she sat. Uh, sat with her friend there in the church and uh, her son was uh, listed on the as a church member but and she was a church member on the church roll listed so we went to speak to her and I said uh, I called her Miss Jones I said Miss Jones uh, I'm so glad to meet you see you tonight I know your son's away at work or whatever and uh, when did you lose your husband? I, didn't, I knew she lost her husband before I ever arrived there. And she told me what year it was. And, and, um, and I said, we're so glad that you're part of the church and that you, I see you on Sundays. And I asked her about Sunday school or something like that. And she said she didn't go to Sunday school. But she said, preacher, you need to know something. I am not a member of the church. 
I said, uh, you're not. So I looked at the deacon, and he almost fell out of the chair. And uh, he'd been coming for years, too. And so I said, uh, Miss Jones, uh, have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior, Lord? I mean, turn from your sin and place faith in Jesus. She said, no. And uh, so we talked to her about Jesus, and she asked Jesus to come into her life. Later baptized her. I mean, she, we're talking 70, I'd say 75 at that time. I'm not quite sure what it was, but uh, sometimes people are confused, and I believe it's, it's the devil's plan to confuse people. And, uh, but anyway, so many religions, so many traditions, so many feelings, but there's no transformation, no salvation, no change of the mind and heart. We want to be written, as we said today, in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus, written in red. Well, tonight, secondly, we want to look at the person of salvation here in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28. Jesus said, come to the pastor. Uh, come unto the deacons. Come unto the church. Uh, come unto rig religion. Jesus said, come to me. Who is he? Eternal Son of God, the divine God who became the human Son. John 1, verse 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Was God. This logos in Greek, the communication of God to us, he said, I'm coming in the person of my Son. Friends, when you, when you meet people, you need to explain that to them about Jesus. Because if you, if, you, if you miss God becoming man, Jesus becomes just another person. This is a teachable moment. If you do not do that, they'll just think Jesus is like all the rest of them, religious people of the world. It's very important that you share that somehow in some way with the person who wants to know Jesus. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the only Savior. He's not one Savior out of many. He's not one out of a many. He's what? The only one. See, it's very important. He died on the cross to save us. And he's the only Lord. He's king. He's master. The Father made him that. There are those who say any religion is fine. Have you ever heard that? As long as you are sincere... I remember the story that came to my mind uh, this past week. Oh, Charlie Brown. You remember Charlie Brown, don't you? Charles Schultz. It's just a, just a great little comic strip. Well, anyway, Charlie would take the ball. He was, he was batting, playing baseball. He'd take the ball up and swing at it. You know, so he picked it up, threw it, swung. He missed. He picked it up and swung again. He picked it up again. And he swung. He said, strike three and you're out. He said, well, Listen. I was still very sincere. But he didn't hit the ball. You see? It's, it's like Jesus. We throw Jesus up here and throw up another religious person and throw up this. And, but they don't know Christ. They miss him. They miss it every time. So I want to help people. Islam. Oh, Muhammad will get us to God. Oh, he's the great prophet. Well, he's dead. His bones are ashes in that little tomb. Jehovah's Witness says, uh, Jesus is the archangel Michael, one of many sons, little s, of God. That's not what Jesus said. The only begotten son of God. Capital S. Mormons, Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith, you know, he found the tablets in the hills and mountains of Utah, I guess about 160 plus years ago now. He's not going to get you to heaven. He's not going to give you eternal salvation. No religion. Jesus said in John 10, 
Let me read you a few of these verses. This is a great shepherd chapter, good shepherd. John 10 and 7. Then said Jesus unto to them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by who? Me. By me, that's Jesus. If any man enter in, he shall go be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. It's Jesus. He said he is the way. He is the only way to enter. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We quoted that this morning. Who comes to the Father? How do you come to the Father? No man coming to the Father, but by me. It means only one exception. There's only one. All the others, it's not any good. Can't get there. The apostles in Acts 4, 12, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name. One name. Who's that name? Jesus. Come unto me. Jesus said, he is the one. Many today say you're narrow-minded, pastor, intolerant, disrespectful of people. Well, you talk to God the Father about Jesus. God loved us so much that he gave whom? His only begotten son, John 3, 16. Let Jesus confront you. Jesus the son. Enter ye in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. For wide, broad is the way of destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. It's narrow. He is the way. No other way. Just one. He said that. He stands before us at the cross. How, how wide is salvation? How wide is it? It's right here. As wide as the cross. Say cross. He said, why is the cross? It's not over there. It's not over to the left. It's, it's narrow. He said it. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. And Jesus died, buried, and arose again as a living Lord to live forever so we can live. The call from Jesus is the person of salvation. Come to me. Thirdly, notice the perimeter of salvation. All, all people, he says. Come unto me, all, all. Now we know that all won't, won't come. But the offer is there this perimeter, a measure, a boundary. How far does it reach? God so loved the world. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He loves big children, youth, adults, seniors. Salvation is a picture of missions here. Come unto me all. Going to all the world, Mark 16 and 15. Second Peter 3, 9. He's long-suffering, patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's no boundary concerning the place for Jesus to meet you. The gospel reaches in all places, wherever a person lives. Salvation extends to all positions of life. doesn't matter if you're high up in your business world or if you're just a worker on the street. It can be secretaries, housewives, doctors, lawyers. You can even be a painter. 
I ended up messing with Dave. Now, he really is a painter now. But isn't it wonderful that he reaches out to all? Jesus Christ can change lives in all ages. Children, youth, the adults. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Number four tonight, I want you to notice the people of salvation. People. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And we get the picture here, the heavy laden animals like the yoke, the uh, yoke of the oxen, this harness, this strapping. Uh, I was telling Martha the other day, I, I think about the old mules at home. I... I saw the mules and how I did and then put the harness. I was too small. I couldn't reach up and do that, you know. And he didn't want me to hold the mules because the mules would take me right away. But the oxen in the field, they were hooked together and they had a big load to pull and it was, it was like a burden, heavy burden. These plows and whatever else they were pulling, wagons. They were weighted down. How many people are weighted down, heavy laden in sin today? You know what the heaviest load in the world is? I call it the I weight. Capital I, the I weight. That's the that's heaviest load. That really comes from sin, our self-centered, our own ways. We're away from God's way and God's will. We say we're going to do it our way. We're going to be disobedient. And the burden becomes very, very heavy. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sin of the world, John 1 and 29. See, he takes away that great heavy burden. The cross, Jesus died for us, Romans 5, 8. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took our burden. Look to him. Trust him. Lay the burden of sin on him. We can be heavy laden with demands of religion. Pharisees have a heavy laden on the law. They were very weak on love. Jesus and, you know, the, uh, the Jewish leaders really got their heads. Uh, they got really, he really shook them up many times. Heavy on rituals and push aside relationships. We're heavy on an outward show and forget God looks at the inward man. Heavy on sacrifices, but they forgot the simple heart of love and service. Heavy laden tonight in the weariness in their search for God. People are striving to find God. But God's come to us in the person of Jesus. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus said to Philip, John 14 and 9, on the hillside outside Jerusalem at Mount Calvary, crucified, Jesus Christ nailed, died at the cross, buried, third day rose again. We see the empty tomb. Then we look up and he ascended into heaven. Are we looking again in the eastern sky that he's coming again? There's a song said years ago, he was there all the time. Time after time, I went searching for him. I went searching for that peace in some void. There are broken relationships all around us. Jesus came for those who labor and are heavy laden. He takes it upon himself to give us his salvation. A fifth thing tonight is a promise of salvation. Promise of salvation. In verse 28, he says, I will give you what? Rest. Rest. You know, Jesus frees us from all these burdens put upon us. Gives us peace with God. And pours in his wonderful love. Now, rest is not the end of all of our effort. See, the relationship of God changes meaningless toil and labor into spiritual purpose. 
And so what we do must be centered in Christ. So how are we going to find this true satisfaction, this true rest? In our families, we, we have loved ones with us. We try to find peace and rest and satisfaction in our family, and that's great. But it only lasts for a period of time. It's only temporary. No matter how long our years we live, the Father brings us into His family, how? Through adoption, through His Son, by faith in Jesus. And we're adopted and we're part of His family, how long? Everlasting family, eternal family. What about friends? People go to their friends to find satisfaction or rest, and, but that's only for a period of time. There are friends who come and go. But our greatest friend is Jesus. Sticks closer than a brother. He gives us true rest. We think of the law. People go to the law if they can do enough rules and if they follow a certain number of rules. No, true rest comes in fearing and trusting and loving God through His Son. Then we obey His commands. And are willing to, to love him and serve him. What about things, possessions? People try to find a lot of satisfaction in possessions and things. They buy and sell and acquire. And what is going to happen to them? They pass away, don't they? But we surrender all things first. Surrender your life to the master. He will grant you true satisfaction and rest. Horatius Bonner, Horatius Bonner, wrote a poem that summed up his life. He said, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Has he made you glad? You find rest and true satisfaction in Christ. A wonderful promise. What's it like to receive an invitation? We said you may receive it from a family, from a friend, co-worker, church family. Tonight we've talked about an invitation from the King of Kings, very personal. Come, come to me. It's a challenging, it's simple, but it's true. Come to me, Jesus said. Do we hear it? Do we believe it? Do we know it? Do we ever share it? What will you do with Jesus? The old song says, neutral, you cannot be. I think I told some time ago about the young man I was talking to. He said, I don't do anything for Jesus or I don't do anything against Jesus. He said, neutral you cannot be. Neutral you cannot be. Tonight to the unsaved one, come to Jesus. Realize your sin. It's, it's a great burden. If you want to know about your sin, look at the Ten Commandments. You ever lied? You ever took God's name in vain? You ever murdered? You say, oh, no, I don't murder. Uh, Jesus said you had anger in your heart. What about adultery? I don't commit sexual sins. Uh, when have you lusted after another of the opposite sex? You see? It's clear that we are all sinners. Amen? That's very clear. It's, it's not hard to understand it once we get a picture of the word and law of God. But he wants you to turn from that and admit it. Repent from your sin and believe Christ, this perfect son of God, died at the cross for your sins, took your judgment, your guilt, my guilt, his blood was poured out at the cross. 
And then he arose to prove his power over sin and death and hell and the grave. We confess Jesus as Savior Lord publicly. We ask you to come, then later desire baptism as we saw this morning. It's a beautiful picture. Unchurched, did you come into his church? You may be already a Christian. You need to belong to his body of believers in the local church family. Christian tonight, I know many of you love Jesus. I want you to make a new dedication this week. As you think about that one verse, come unto me, Jesus said, why don't you invite somebody to come to Jesus? Would you try? Could you text? Could you email a few sentences? Just say, I'd like to share with you a few scripture verses. Could you do it? Live for Jesus. Be his faithful disciple. As we stand together.